It's up to you to decide whether the title of this lecture was actually composed by me or by the neural network I was telling you about in the previous lecture. <laughs> I'm going to talk about a particular computational principle um, that seems to explain several apparently very different things. Um, also, it allows us to make neural nets work much better. Um, I actually thought about this principle a number of years ago um, because of problems interacting with my bank. And then I heard a talk by Papa Dimitriou um, last fall, and he'd come up with the same principle for explaining um, sexual reproduction. And so I decided I'd better go back and try this principle some more. And it really works well for neural nets. So, so here's the problem with sexual reproduction. Um, you want a bunch of genes to work well together in order to have some effect. And if you take some of your genes from your mother and some of your genes from your father, um, you'll break up co-adaptations. And so sexual reproduction looks like a problem because it looks like it's going to make organisms less fit by breaking up co-adapted sets of genes. Now, the interesting thing in the work by Livnat and Papadimitriou is that they argue that's precisely why you have it. It's really important to break up these co-adaptations. And these co-adaptations, where lots of things work carefully together, are a really bad idea in the long run. And there's two reasons why they might be a bad idea. The first reason is it might get you into kind of evolutionary cul-de-sac, where you've got lots of things that all rely on each other being just right. And to change anything, you have to change everything. And so that's an optimization problem. And I don't know if there's much evidence for that. Certainly, I haven't seen much evidence for that from machine learning. But there's another reason why you don't want co-adaptations, which is if the environment changes and things aren't quite like they were when you evolved, then if you're relying on a big, complicated interaction, something's likely to go wrong. Whereas if you can rely on lots of little interactions, each of which only involves a few genes, when the environment changes, some of those won't work anymore, but other ones will work. And so it's a good idea not to have big, complex co-adaptations of many genes, but to have lots of redundant, small co-adaptations of a few genes. And that sort of helps to explain why genes have meaning at all. Because you might have thought that, you know, a thousand genes would all work together to produce something. You'd never be able to figure out what one of them did. Now I want to use the same principle for explaining neural communication. Um, so cortical neurons do something that seems weird if you're an electrical engineer. Um, they send these spikes of activity, and the spikes of activity appear to have random timing. Now, of course, that might just be because we don't know enough. Um, but a pretty good model of a cortical neuron is that it has an underlying Poisson rate that comes from the inputs it gets, and then it emits spikes according to this Poisson rate. So they're sort of inherently stochastic. And the question is, if you wanted to do signal processing, which would you rather have? Um, these binary values that are stochastic or real numbers? Now, you'd have thought anybody in their right mind who wanted to do signal processing would prefer to have a real number. And so many neuroscientists say, well, yeah, sure, a, neuro, a real number would be better, but neurons just can't do that. But that seems unlikely to me. I mean, evolution figured out how to make teeth and eyeballs out of the same stuff. And if it wants to communicate a real number, I'm sure it could do it. And in fact, with neurons, there's an easy way to communicate a real number. And so just to sort of block the argument evolution doesn't do it because it can't, because there's no way to do it with the brain, I want to sketch out an idea that's almost certainly wrong, um, but is a simple way to use the timing of spikes to communicate real numbers inside a computation where you're trying to do things like scalar products. So what we'd like to do is send numbers from one neuron to another, activation levels or something like that, using the time of a spike. But we also want to do computations on these numbers. In particular, we want to take scalar products. So let's suppose we want to take the scalar product of a vector of numbers represented by spike times and a vector of numbers represented by synaptic weights. And the question is, and then we want to make the answer be the time of a spike, be represented by the time of a spike, so we can do that in many levels. It turns out that's quite easy to do. So here's a sketch for how you do it. You have to have an underlying oscillation, and you have to do it in little time windows. So 
we're going to represent a real number by the advance of a spike. So a spike occurring here represents a big number, and a spike occurring later, like here, represents a small number. And we're going to have a very simple model of a synapse, which says, um, when a spike arrives at a synapse, it causes charge to be injected, and it caused, causes charge to be injected over the next 10 milliseconds or so at a roughly constant rate. Obviously, there's all sorts of elaborations. So now, the spike arrives and charge gets injected at this rate, which is the strength of the synapse. So by the time we get to the end of the window, that much charge has been injected. And at this connection, incoming connection to the neuron here, the spike arrived there, we injected charge at a lower rate, this much charge was injected. So by the time we get to the end of this time window here, the amount of charge injected is the scalar product of the T's and the W's. So we can do our scalar product in a very natural way by using the addition of charge to do the add in the scalar product and by using an integral over time to do the multiply in the scalar product. Okay, but now how do we turn that back into a spike time? So the idea is, at the end of the time window, you then start injecting more charge, and you inject more charge at a rate of 1 minus the sum of the incoming weights of that neuron. Notice this doesn't depend on the activities, on the times. This just depends on the weights of the neuron. So a neuron could learn that quantity. So we inject charge at this rate. Now, if there was no, no depolarization of the neuron at the beginning, if nothing had been injected, it would take us till t before we cross the threshold of t. But if we already injected some charge, it'll take us less time. And the amount less time it'll take us is equal to the amount of charge we've injected. And so the advance of the next spike, when this neuron crosses threshold, will be equal to the amount of charge you injected by the end of the window before you started putting in this extra charge. And so what I've shown you ha is how in um, two time windows, you can first um, do a scalar product and get it as an amount of charge, and then convert that into the advance in the next time window into the advance of a spike. So this is all just made up, but this was very influential on me because it said, look, it's not hard for the brain to send real numbers as spike times, and it can do all these accurate computations if it wants, so why doesn't it? And there really isn't much evidence that the cortex does that. There's other parts of the brain where we, where we think it does use spike times. So in hippocampus, at a, at a slower time scale, there's place cells, and they go ping when a rat's in a particular place, but the precise time at which they go ping relative to a theta rhythm tells you where in the place field it is. This is still a somewhat controversial theory, even though it's been around for many years, but most neuroscientists seem to believe that. And we know that when you use the two ears to locate sound, you're using the relative time of two spikes accurate to within a few microseconds. Um, so you can use spike timing very accurately if you need to, but why doesn't cortex do it? And like I say, one theory is evolution failed to discover it. The only alternative to that is our basic ideas about signal processing are hopelessly wrong, because our basic ideas about signal processing say you'd like to have real numbers, and maybe there's something wrong with that. So the question is, how could communicating one noisy bit, one stochastic bit, possibly be better than sending a real number? Because that's what I'm going to argue now. I'm going to argue the brain sends these noisy bits because that's a more effective thing to send than a precise real number. That seems like a tough case to make. Um, when an engineer fits a model to data, they know what kind of model they're trying to fit. Um, it's often something like a linear dynamical system. It's just one model. They want to identify the parameters of this dynam dynamical system. And then they want to use real arithmetic. But that's not the kind of problem the brain faces. The kind of problem the brain faces is you've got this huge complex reality, you haven't got a clue what's going on, and you want to fit like a gazillion models and use model averaging to try and cope with the fact you don't know what's going on. Okay. And if that's the situation you're in, then stochastic binary spikes are much better than real numbers. So, um, one reason engineers ought to think about this is when we start simulating really big neural nets, like nets with, say, a billion neurons in, they're going to have to be spread over many processes, and that means the activities of the neurons, each process is going to have to deal with a subset of the neurons, and so these processes are going to have to communicate the states of neurons to one another. 
Now, if they can communicate an individual bit for the state of a neuron, you're going to have 32 times less communication than if they had to send a 32-bit real number. Um, and 32 is quite a big win. That's about the win we got from using GPUs, and that had a huge effect. OK, so I'm going to come back to why it's a good idea to send spikes rather than real numbers and relate it to the issue about why it's a good idea to have sex to break up co-adaptations. And right now I'm going to make what seems like a complete change of topic. Um, but it isn't really. So I've argued that these big deep neural nets are very good at doing things like speech and vision. So the question is, what can't they do? Well, here's one thing they can't do, or they apparently can't do, which is um, have a system where you have lots of neural nets and you average what they predict. And the reason you can't do that is it takes a long time to train one neural net. And you just can't afford the time to train, say, a million of them. Um, you'd love to train a million of them, preferably all on different data, and then average what they say. But it's kind of too slow. It's too slow both at training time and at testing time, because at testing time we're going to have to run all million to average what they say. Now, there are systems that are much faster where you can do that. They're called decision trees. And there you can train, say, a thousand decision trees, all on different data, average what they say at test time, because at test time they're very fast, and it works extremely well. For any of these machine learning competitions, like the Netflix competition, it's obvious that to get really good performance, you have to average the predictions of lots of different models. Um, so model averaging is a real win. If the models are really simple, like decision trees, you can afford to average a lot of them. And the connect box that you, know, you dance around in front of it and it knows what depth your hands are at, um, and it recognizes which is your hands and which is your feet, um, that uses random forests. That is, it uses a whole bunch of decision trees to um, decide what's going on. And we'd like to do that with neural nets. But it looks like it's going to be really expensive. And I'm going to show you how you can do it really cheaply. So first, a little aside. There's two ways to average models. You can take arithmetic means or geometric means. So when you make a, I mean, arithmetic means is what you do in mixtures. But when you're doing model averaging, if model A predicts this, that the probabilities of three classes are like that, and model B predicts like this, then when you combine them, you get predictions like that, but you're softer. OK? They're always going to be softer than these predictions. If you, an alternative is you can take a geometric mean um, where you multiply these two together and then take a square root if there's two models. And so these are your predictions. And now those don't add up to 1, so you better normalize by dividing by the sum of all these numbers. And so here you're taking a geometric mean of the probabilities, here you're taking an arithmetic mean of the probabilities. I'm going to talk about this kind of model averaging. You can prove nice things about both kinds. You can prove that a geometric mean is guaranteed to be expected to, guaranteed to, be expected to work better than picking one at random. Of course, you might be unlucky in picking one. If you pick the really good one, it will work better than the geometric mean. But actually, as soon as you have a lot of models, the geometric mean will always work much better than any one of the individual models, almost always. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about doing this kind of model averaging, where you take a geometric mean of the predictions over class probabilities. And here's the way you do it. It's very simple. Let's do it for a start with a net with one hidden layer. Here's our image. Here's our class labels. Here's our hidden units. Each time we present an image to the net, we take each of the hidden units, and with a probability of 0.5, we remove it. It's just simply not there. In other words, we're sampling an architecture. If there's h hidden units, there's two to the h possible architectures. And each time we present a pattern, we sample one of these architectures. And then we train that particular architecture. Now, of course, all these architectures share weights. Um, in fact, each architecture, as soon as h is large, each architecture will only ever be trained on one example once. Next time you see that example, you use a different architecture. But because they all share weights, that works fine. Most architectures will never be trained at all. Um, sharing weights acts as a really good regularizer. It's much better than things like L1 and L2. And it turns out this works really well. One way of thinking about it is that we're going to be training a subset of these 2 to the h different models. And then at test time, 
we're going to be taking the geometric mean of what all 2 to the h models predict. Um, so this is a really extreme form of bagging where your training set for each model is just one case and you just train once. Um, and the weight sharing is a really strong regularizer, which you're obviously going to have to need if most of the models aren't trained at all. Um, at test time, what you could do is sample, get some predictions, sample again, get some predictions, sample again, get some predictions. And in a brain, you probably need to do that. So in a brain, if you want an accurate answer, you probably need to sample several times on average. Um, but in an artificial neural net, you can do the following. You take your hidden units, you halve their outgoing weights, and you use them all. So while you're training, the hidden unit's there with a probability of a half, and you decide randomly if it's there or not. And so only about half the hidden units are there. At test time, the hidden unit's definitely there, but its outgoing weights are only half as big. And you can show that if the hidden units connect to a softmax output, um, that is exactly equivalent to taking the geometric mean of what all 2 to the h different networks predict. So now we have a very fast way of doing model averaging with neural nets. You have a sign of oversized net. Within that net, there's the gazillion different architectures. You sample them at random. And then at test time, you use all of the hidden units, but at half strength. And it works really well. It's always good when they ask the questions on the next slide. You know, you're pulling them along nicely. Um, OK, if we have more than one hidden layer, the math isn't exact anymore. That is, when you halve the outgoing weights of each unit and add them together at the f and look what happens at the final layer, it's not exactly the geometric mean of what you get if you sampled. But it's close. It's like a mean field approximation. And it's good enough. And it's much better than um, what you get if you didn't use this trick. This is the magic trick Alex Krushevsky was using that got his object recognition error rate down from 45% to 39%. And in general, if you try this on any old neural net, it'll, make it, it'll get rid of 10% of your errors. Obviously, that can't be a precise statement. Um, sometimes it's only 5%. Um, but it seems to be very robust. So what we typically do is, if you have lots of hidden layers, you leave out half the units in each hidden layer. Um, and that works better than just choosing one hidden layer, leaving out half the hidden units. This is a really dumb idea, right? Why didn't anybody try this before? Um, almost certainly they did, and they're going to tell me in one of these talks. I published that in 1981 or something. Um, but I, they haven't told me yet. Um, you could do the same for the input layer. Why didn't people think of that before? Well, that they did think of before. That's called a denoising autoencoder. Um, so Yoshio's Benjo group showed that autoencoders work much better if you leave out some of the input units. Um, this trick is just doing the same trick but for hidden units and do for every layer of hidden units. There's a version of this trick that's very well known um, and is used an awful lot at Google. Um, suppose you're doing logistic regression and you have a huge number of features. So suppose you have a billion features here, and you're trying to predict some, whether something is or is not a member of a class. So a binary decision based on a billion features. Um, what you could do is you could do logistic regression. That is, you learn coefficients to put on all these features, and then you put them through a logistic function and you make your decision. But that might overfit if you had, say, a billion features and only 100,000 training cases. In fact, it would overfit. Here's something else you could do. You could say, I'm going to get rid of all but one of the features. And I'm going to do logistic regression with just that one feature to learn this weight. That's called naive Bayes. If you look at what naive Bayes is doing, it's equivalent to doing logistic regression with one input. And then in naive Bayes at test time, we'll use all of the features. And if we're just making a decision, we don't need to take the nth root of what they all predict, because that won't affect what the max is. Um, but if we're actually making a probabilistic prediction over many classes and we want the probabilities, we really ought to take the nth root of what all these guys predict between them. So naive Bayes is just an, an extreme version of dropout 
where you drop out all but one. That immediately suggests that there's all sorts of methods in between logistic regression and naive Bayes where you drop out a subset. You might even learn to learn a probability with which each feature should be dropped out. And that's going to work better on many cases than either the extreme version of naive Bayes or the other extreme of logistic regression. Um, and that's hardly been explored at all. It's very close to what statisticians explore, but they're trying to find which features to drop out instead of saying, let's just drop them out at random. Okay. So let me show you how well it works. Um, here's an experiment by Nitish Travasto, who's one of my students, on MNIST. And until fairly recently, vanilla backprop operating on vanilla MNIST, that is where you don't give it any information about transformations, and you don't tell it which pixels next to which other pixel by putting in a convolutional net or anything. You just treat it as a pure machine learning problem where there's a 784 dimensional input vector and there's 10 classes, and that's all you're telling it. Um, one way of saying that is if you permuted the pixels, it wouldn't make any difference as long as it's always the same permutation. So that's why I call this permutation invariant MNIST. Um, you get about 160 errors if you train back properly very carefully. If you look on Jan's website, that's what it says you get. Actually, there's one, pub there's one result unpublished that gets 153 errors, and that's by me. Um, and it's unpublished um, partly because I couldn't replicate it very well, and partly because I used a dirty trick, um, which I never got around to publishing. Um, but anyway, now we can beat it by a lot. So, this is 160 errors, this is 80 errors. These are nets that are trained with random dropout, and this is just dropping out the hidden units, and this is dropping out the input units too. When we drop out the input units, we um, keep them with a probability of 0.8, whereas, or 0.7, whereas for the hidden units, we only keep them with a probability of 0.5. We have a big learning rate, and then what we do is we start with a big learning rate and then reduce the learning rate as we go, so things wobble around but, and settle down. And you can see we get, instead of 160, we get about 135 errors with nets that are clearly much too big for this task. They have things like two layers of 1,200 units each, so you've got a couple of million parameters in this net, maybe three million parameters, and it's being fitted to only 60,000 training cases. So it's much too large, you'd have thought. But this dropout acts as a really good regularizer, although we use another regularizer too that makes it work even better. And this is when you drop out the inputs. And this net here is getting down to just above 100 errors. And um, this is without any pre-training. This is just by using dropout on the hidden units and the inputs. And this is a net with three hidden layers. It's got three hidden layers of 1,200 units. But that's just a toy problem. And this, this isn't a real result, this is just a result on a toy problem to get an idea that it works. I'll give you some real results in a minute. The one other constraint we use is, instead of using an L2 penalty on the weights, we limit, Jan talked about this I think, we limit the length of the weight vector coming into each hidden unit. So we say that weight vector is not allowed to get above a certain length, and if it does, you normalize it by division. That stops the weights ever blowing up, and that means you can use a very big learning rate. So one, once you do that, you can afford to use a very big learning rate. The weights will all hit their limits, and then all that's happening is the weight vectors are rotating. And if you use a very big learning rate, you're thrashing around in that space, and then you gradually decrease the learning rate. So you're doing a much more thorough search of weight space than you do when you start near the origin and very conservatively trickle along. Um, you're thrashing around to begin with, and then gradually cooling down and thrashing around less and finding structure. And th this seems to be important to make it work really well. Then we tried Timit. So on Timit, um, we had sort of overfitted Timit by using standard preprocessing lots of times. And so we went to a new version of preprocessing that we hadn't used before. So we were overfitting less. And also so it's easier to say exactly what we did. Um, this is the Caldi system developed by Dan Povey for doing speech preprocessing. Um, Nitish did um, pre-training followed by fine-tuning and got 22.7% um, on that data. 
He then applied dropout to this net and got 19.7%. Um, so that's a win of um, 3 in 20, which is more than 10%. Um, and that's a record for speaker independent recognition on Timit. Timit's still fairly small, it's only three hours. Um, one funny thing about speech is, because it's been an important problem for so long, they have collected huge databases. So on the whole, for speech for English, um, you have lots of labeled data, and regularizers like this aren't that important. For rare languages, this will be very important, where you don't have much labeled data. This is showing you not the error rate on recognizing the phones, but the error rate on classifying the phones. So in a speech recognizer, your neural net makes bets about what the phones are, and then these bets are all put together by a hidden Markov model, which makes the final decisions. And speech people are interested in how good those final decisions are after the hidden Markov model has put things together. But you can also measure how good your initial bets are. They're not as good as the final decisions, obviously. And so the classification error rate of the neural net at saying what phone the central, what HMM state the central frame of the acoustics represents. Um, if you train without dropout, it comes down and then it goes up again because you're overfitting. And early stopping, if you stopped at the ideal point, would get you here or here or here. If you train with dropout, it just keeps coming down and goes way below where early stopping will get. And what's more, it doesn't overfit, even though these are huge nets for the amount of data we have. So this is a net with 31 input frames. Which one? Yeah, the black one here has 31 input frames and three layers of 4,000 in units. Um, and all of these are doing about the same, and they're not significantly overfitting. We tried it on document classification, and there it's only worth about 3 or 4%. Um, so there are problems where it's not an, a huge win, but it's still a win. So we took a big document data set and um, reduced it to word counts. Um, and then tried to predict the class of the document from the word count vector using some hidden units. And without dropout, it, it goes like this and then overfits. With dropout, it goes lower and doesn't overfit. And you can use, um, this is a bigger net than that net, right? So you can use quite big nets and you do better. Here's an example by Alex on CIFAR 10. He took a net that was trained on these 32 by 32 color images with um, 50,000 training examples and 10,000 test examples. And they're 10 different classes, so it's as like MNIST as possible. Um, a big convolutional net, um, which at the time was a record, was getting, it was a record for things where you don't transform the data to make it easier. Um, was getting 18% error. He applied dropout and that came down to 16% error. He's now down below that. Um, now let me give you another way of thinking about dropout, which is the way I arrived at it. Um, I used to go to my bank and every few weeks the tellers would be different. You know, I'd get to know a teller and they'd know who I was and then I'd go back a month later and it was a different teller. And the teller I knew wasn't there and the different teller was very suspicious and wanted to see my credit card and blah blah blah. Um, so eventually I said why is it never the same teller? What's going on? And the teller said I don't know but you know every six months they move us to a different branch. And so I thought about this and I thought well why would they do that? Um, it's crazy. It's bad for customer relations. And the answer is if you want to defraud a bank the best people to defraud the bank I'm sure we're all now on the side of the people who are defrauding the bank. The best people are the tellers, but to do that, they'd, they'd need the collaboration of a customer or another teller. And so what the bank wants to do is prevent conspiracies between customers and tellers or between tellers and tellers. And that's why they're shuffling them all the time. Um, they're trying to break up friendships. So, because they're evil. Um, <laughs> So what's happening is breaking up conspiracies might be a good idea. And then I thought, started thinking about overfitting in neural nets. And what hidden units are doing in a normal backprop net, every hidden unit is being trained to fix up the problems that are left over when all the other hidden units have had their say. It's not being trained to get the right answer by itself. It's being trained to fix up the residual problems. 
left by all the other guys. And so there's, comp there's a lot of interaction there. It's not being trained to do something that's individually sensible. In fact, statisticians will tell you proudly that logistic regression will sometimes fit a coefficient that's of the opposite sign from the correlation between the input and the answer because it's fixing up the problems created by all the other coefficients. And that's a cute property of logistic regression. But that's a very dangerous thing to do if the test data might be significantly different from the training data. Um, if you break up these conspiracies by, for example, removing other hidden units so you don't know who you're going to have to be working with, then an individual hidden unit has to do something that's sensible by itself. Um, now, it mustn't do the same sensible thing as other hidden units, because they're already taking care of that. It has to do something that works well with combinatorially collect many different combinations of the other hidden units, which will tend to be something that's individually sensible. It won't be one of those negative coefficients in logistic regression that goes the wrong way. It'll be something individually sensible, but that's nevertheless different from what everybody else is doing. Those are what you want in features if you want good generalization. So, for example, imagine you had a linear model and you fitted it to data. And the data has two training cases. Um, the input is 1, 1, 0, 0, and the output is 6. And the input is 1, 1, 1, 1, and the output is 4. Well, here's a linear model that works just fine. Um, you have plus 5 on that, plus 11 on that, plus 4 on that, and minus 6 on this. And that'll give you the right answers. But these guys are too highly co-adapted. This minus 5 is relying on that plus 11. And if the plus 11 went away, this would be a stupid thing to do. Um, if you look at weights like this, these are far less co-adapted, and they'll be far more robust to changing the, um, changing the data in ways that weren't experienced during training. And of course, things like L2 regularizers are favoring this over that. But dropout is an even better way of favoring them. So I've introduced dropout as a way of doing model averaging averaging many different architectures. But you could also think of it as a way of doing adding noise. Um, so the idea of averaging models and the idea of regularizing by adding noise, they're not really separate ideas. They sort of merge into one another. And Dropout's an example of both. Now sparse coding. OK. In sparse coding, what we do is we get a large dictionary of basis functions. And we insist that most of the coefficients be zero. And that's a very sensible way to code an image. I'm not arguing with that as a way of coding an image. Um, having a, a highly overcomplete dictionary that has complicated things in it that happen to just nicely fit your data and explain lots of what's going on in the data in one basis function, that's a great thing to have. Um, if you can afford enough, have as many as you want. Um, the question is, why does that give you good performance on test data when you're drawn from a different distribution. In other words, why do representations produced by sparse coding generalize well? Now, from studying dropout, we know something, which is if you produce a representation and you randomly set a bunch of coefficients to zero, that will make it generalize much better. And what's happening in sparse coding is coefficients are being set to zero by iteratively minimizing an L1 penalty or something like that. And that's, in terms of compressing an image, that's all fine. But if you ask, why does it give good generalization? Why are those basis functions good for generalizing to new test cases? I think it's because these things are being driven to zero and making the code unstable. That is, a basis function doesn't know which other basis functions it's going to have to collaborate with. Because on one image, you might have to collaborate with this guy. And if you change the image ever so slightly, the L1 penalty, instead of this guy being highly active, it might be driven all the way to zero. And so this basis function now has lost his buddy. And so he better not be doing something that relies on this buddy being there. And that means you're going to get a whole bunch of different things that are individually very different from each other and individually sensible. This is just a hypothesis. But I don't believe any of the people who say sparse coding gives you nice basis functions for doing discrimination. They've never tested whether it's because you're minimizing L1 penalty or because you're just sending a bunch of stuff to zero. And if you just randomly set a bunch of stuff to zero, which would be much easier to do, it'll work even better. Okay. 
So if anybody cares to go and do that experiment, you could be the first person to do it. Um, okay. Here's another advantage of using dropout. Um, a neuron is very robust to the loss of co-workers, and so it should make genetic algorithms work much better. So in a genetic algorithm, you train two neural networks, and then you would take half your hidden units from one network and half your hidden units from another network. That would make a child network. That network would already work pretty well if you trained with dropout, because the units would be used to the other guys disappearing. They'd be doing individually sensible things. You now take the child network and train it some more, and it would now work pretty well. And you could imagine using a lot of processes like that. You take each core, you allow it to run one network. Um, so this was suggested by a friend of mine called Inman Harvey, and it's a nice way to run genetic algorithms without having generations and things. You just put one network on each core. Every so often, the network decides, I'm doing pretty well, I'm going to advertise for a mate. So it advertises for a mate, it gets various suitors, it picks one of them, they produce an offspring. Um, the mother network is then suspended. This will sound very familiar to women who've had children. Their life is suspended. And um, all, the effort goes, all the effort of that core goes into making the child good at doing whatever the mother was doing before. Um, this isn't quite like normal life. Then we, <laughs> we make a decision whether to kill the mother or kill the child. We might kill the mother even if the mother's doing better than the child because we might predict that after a while the child will be doing better than the mother. In other words, the child's doing better than the mother was when the mother was that age, um, so we're going to kill the mother. Uh, but you kill one or the other and carry on. Um, if you have networks that are only father networks, this is entirely unfair because they get to produce offspring but never get killed. And so to make this algorithm work properly, you have to have um, networks switch sex randomly every so often. Um, then this algorithm could run on lots of cores and nobody's tried it, so far as I know. Okay, now I'm going to talk about something that sounds very different but is actually just the same um, and relate it back to why neurons send spikes. So if you think about the, the hidden layer where we randomly emitted half the hidden units, what's happening is each neuron, it's a logistic neuron, let's say, it computes an activity P by going through the logistic, and then with probability of a half, it sends P. Okay? That has exactly the same expected value as sending a half with probability P. Okay. So if we say that a spike sent by a neuron corresponds to a half, then a spiking neuron is very similar to one of these hidden units with dropout. It has the same expected output as a hidden unit with dropout. It's just a slightly different kind of noise. Um, so now you might ask, here's a really silly experiment that someone should have done before. Um, you take a normal back propagation net, just a perfectly standard net from the 1980s, um, using logistic units. And on the forward pass, instead of sending that real value p that logistic units computed, you stochastically decide whether to send a 1 or a 0 using that probability p. On the backward pass, you do exactly what you were doing before. Okay. I suspect Yan in his PhD thesis did something slightly like this, um, but I'm not sure, because he's in French. Um, <laughs> so on the backward pass, you just read it like a standard back prop net. Hey presto, it works a whole lot better. Okay, you try it on MNIST, instead of getting 160 errors, it gets like 130 errors. Um, so just making the neuron stochastic, where they send one bit instead of sending a real number, this P, makes them work a lot better. Not on the training data. On the training data, it's worse and it's slower to train. But on the test data, it's much better. So if you think about it, um, with dropout, what's happening is we're sending... The neuron's going to be dropped out half the time, and when it's there, it's going to send p. So the average of what it sends is a half p. So the variance of what it sends is the difference between either 0 and p from a half p, 
squared times 2 is going to look like that. Um, with a stochastic bit, the variance looks like this. You can see that when p is a half, they're the same, which is fortunate. Um, when p is small, this stochastic neuron has even higher variance than dropout. And we're beginning to get the idea that high variance is good, not bad. It's good for generalization. And so that's what the brain's up to. Um, so this, I, I would like to say this just once more. This is how the brain works. <laughs> <laughs> and here's an amusing little piece of history. In my first lecture, I talked about how you train these deep belief nets. And I said the following. You use these restricted Boltzmann machines, and you train them up. And then once you've trained this generative model in multi-layers, you pretend it's just a deterministic model and use backprop. Deterministic backprop. But actually, it works much better if you don't do that silly pretense. You keep it stochastic. You keep doing it for as exactly as you were during the pre-training, and you find it with backprop. It works much better. So if you think about neuroscientists explaining why cortical neurons don't send real values, um, some neuroscientists say, well, they would if they could, but they can't. It's too much trouble. Or, But if you think about the time of a spike, it takes the same amount of sugar to send a spike, whether you time it accurately or not, because it's just the wave of depolarization that's the real cost. Um, so why don't they use the times to send real values? It's just not satisfactory to say they can't do it. They can do it by using the times. And they do do it in some bits of the brain. Evolution didn't figure it out. Well, evolution actually had hundreds of millions of years to figure this out. It wasn't some recent thing. I mean, if it was good to do signal processing by sending real values, evolution would be doing that. And it's because we've formulated the problem wrong. Evolution isn't trying to fit the training data. Evolution is trying to get a system that will generalize well. Um, and if you want to generalize well and you don't know what's going on, fit a gazillion models and use either very noisy spikes or lots of dropout um, so that you can, in effect, fit a gazillion models. And then you'll generalize much better. And if you think what the brain's got to do, the brain has only 10 to the 9 seconds to learn what it's going to learn. Um, and it's got 10 to the 14 parameters to tune. So what the brain is doing is it's throwing an enormous amount of neural hardware at a problem compared with the number of training examples. It's very unlike what a lot of neural nets are doing currently, which is lots of training examples and a small neural net. The brain has many, many more parameters than training examples. And that's going to overfit horribly unless you have a really good regularizer. And this random dropout is just a great regularizer. Or to put it another way, sending stochastic bits is a really good regularizer. So now let's take another look at restricted Boltzmann machines. Because now I've become suspicious, which is Boltzmann machines work better than standard autoencoders. But denoising autoencoders work at least as well as Boltzmann machines, let's say, to be diplomatic. Um, or about as well as Boltzmann machines. But what's the difference? Well, in a Boltzmann machine, you're making the hidden units be noisy. And in a denoising autoencoder, you're making the visible units be noisy. And maybe it's the noisy that's the crucial thing about the Boltzmann machine. Not all this highfalutin math with the e to the minus stuff in. Um, maybe that's all irrelevant, as I will now show you. Science is basically permanent revolution, so don't believe anything I say. <laughs> so with the Boltzmann machine, we got all this fancy math about fitting a generative model. Um, but to fit the model properly, you need to run this Markov chain for a long time. You need to do maximum likelihood learning. And because we're in a hurry, we actually use this contrast divergence training, where you go up and come down and go up again. And um, we say that's an approximation to maximum likelihood learning. But what if it was actually working not because it's an approximation to maximum likelihood learning, but because it's a much better approximation to something else? Um, and some evidence for that is when we pre-train one of these deep nets, it's better to use CD than it is to use maximum likelihood learning. CD actually gives better final performance on discrimination than if you do proper maximum likelihood learning at each layer. So let's try and get another look at CD. And let's look at it without thinking about e to the minus anything. So first of all, what's the difference between an autoencoder and a restricted Boltzmann machine? 
So what an autoencoder tries to do is make the reconstruction match the data. A real restricted Boltzmann machine trained with maximum likelihood does not try and do that. What it tries to do is make the distribution of the reconstructions match the distribution of the data. If that happens, then it's happy. It'll stop learning. But that doesn't mean it has to reconstruct A as A. It's quite happy to reconstruct image A as image B, as long as it also sometimes reconstructs image B as image A, with the appropriate probabilities to get detailed balance. Um, and you really see the difference if the, one of the pixels is pure random noise. In an autoencoder, you use lots of your capacity to code that pixel so that you can reconstruct it correctly. In a Boltzmann machine trained by maximum likelihood, you will completely ignore that pixel. You'll let the bias of the pixel take care of how often it should be on, and you won't bother to make it affect the hidden units. So that makes the difference very clear. But if you train with CD, then this noisy pixel will affect the hidden units. Um, so here's a picture of CD training. We take the data, we activate the hidden units, we reconstruct the data, and we activate the hidden units again. Now in my tech report on how to train Boltzmann machine, restricted Boltzmann machines, I say it's very important to make these stochastic, but you don't have to make these stochastic. So let's suppose for now we're going to make these stochastic, binary stochastic neurons, but we're going to make these be deterministic neurons. And the learning rule for a full Boltzmann machine looks like this. And if we curtail the chain, we get this learning rule. And if you add those two things together, the green term and the red term, you get, if you substitute S's here for V's and H's, you get the expectations of these two guys being on together, minus the expectation of them being on together when you made a reconstruction. But let's keep the terms separate for now. This first term here in green is this activity times the difference between what you reconstruct and what you should have reconstructed. That's this. It's just the delta rule, right? And that is the derivative of the reconstruction error with respect to this weight here. Okay? So this term in the CD learning rule is computing the derivative for this weight. Now this weight is tied to this weight here because it's symmetric. So to do backprop, we need to somehow back propagate through these units to compute derivatives for these weights too and then add up these two derivatives to get the full derivative. And we're going to do that back propagation in a funny way. Instead of going backwards, we're going to go forwards. So when you do back propagation, you take the errors, you take the derivatives of errors with respect to these guys, you multiply by them by the weights going coming from J, add them up put them through the nonlinearity of J, where it currently is on its operating curve, the slope, and that gives you an error derivative for J with respect to these inputs here, and then you use that to change this weight. And CD is doing the same thing. What it's doing is, instead of multiplying um, this way, it's multiplying this way, but these weights are the same as those weights, so it's doing the same thing. So it takes this unit J, it takes an error derivative from these guys, multiplies them by the weights on the connections, adds them up, and then it puts it through the slope of the nonlinearity. And it puts it through the slope of the nonlinearity by going forwards through the nonlinearity instead of by going backwards. So this will make it a bit clearer. You put in a visible vector. You get a hidden vector. Let's suppose that the autoencoder is already working. It's working pretty well, OK? So now that hidden vector will reconstruct the visible vector plus a small error which we'll call delta v. That's a vector of small errors for these units. And let's make these be deterministic units so that what we have here is v plus delta v. Now what goes into the hidden units? Well, what goes into the hidden units is what went in before, the same input as they got before here, that was going to give h, plus an extra input delta v. And this delta v gets multiplied by the incoming weights to a unit like j and gives rise to a delta h. So the delta v times the incoming weights is the change in the input to h. And so the change in the output that h gives will be the change in the input times the slope. And that'll be the change in the output. So the change in the activity of h here will be exactly the thing you need to know about, the derivative of the error with respect to the, what's coming in here in order to change this weight.
And the fact that you use the activity here in the, instead of the activity here is OK to first order because this is small. So actually, uh, when you train an RBM with contrast divergence, it's actually training a stochastic autoencoder where the hidden units are stochastic binary units. And you have a clever way of back propagating through stochastic binary units by going forwards instead of backwards. And this piece of the learning rule is this activity times this error, the difference between h and delta h. And this piece of the learning rule is this activity times this error. When you add them together, you get a good approximation to the full derivative. And actually, that's a better way to understand what this CD training is doing. It's much closer to what's really going on than this idea that it's approximating maximum likelihood learning. OK. Um, well, having seen that, um, we need to actually rescue Bolson machines somehow. I mean, they're in trouble now because they just turn out to be a botched up form of autoencoder that works with stochastic binary units. Um, so let's go to the other extreme and let's ask, can we do proper maximum likelihood training and do they do good things then? Um, so CD was introduced to try and do maximum likelihood training, but in an efficient way. Um, and what I'm going to show you now is a method that um, was first thought about by statisticians a long time ago. And Radford Neal used a method like this in the 90s. And then one of my students, Tamin Tanneman, um, developed it for stochastic for restricted Bolson machines. And what you do is you keep around a bunch of fantasy particles, that is, a bunch of these states of the hidden units and visible units. Um, and instead of starting from the data each time, you just run this little Markov chain for a bit longer each time. But you keep this chain around. So I'll call that a fantasy particle. And you only need to use about 100 fantasy particles if you're doing something like MNIST. And after each weight update, you now run the Markov chain on the fantasy particles a bit further. And that's how you get these um, model-based statistics that you use in the learning algorithm. And it works much better than it ought to. That is, you'd have thought if you have some multimodal energy landscape, 100 particles won't really cover it very well. Um, and actually, this method works really well. And the reason it works is not the reason statisticians think it works. Um, so statisticians think it works because you change your parameters very slightly. You now run your Markov chain for a few more steps. And so your Markov chain is always staying close to equilibrium. But actually, if you do that, if you run the Markov chain, the change the parameters slow enough to do that, the learning will take an awful long time. You can actually change parameters much faster than that, and the whole process still works. And so the question is, why? Um, and what's happening is there's a subtle interaction between the learning and the mixing of the Markov chain. Now, Russell and Selakudinov will talk about this a lot more, I think, when he talks about Boltzmann machines at the end of the course. But I just wanted to mention a little bit for the next five minutes to sort of soften you up for when Russ explains it properly. Um, what's happening is you're using these fantasy particles to decide how to get this term that gets subtracted from the gradient in the learning algorithm. And so if you remember what Jan said about digging holes in an energy landscape and raising bits, the statistics you get on the data are causing you to lower the energy where the data is. And these fantasy particles are rushing around and saying, wherever a fantasy particle is, raise the energy. So if you think what's going to happen, suppose we have an energy landscape like this. And suppose this barrier is so high and there's just no chance of our Markov chain jumping this barrier. That's a situation in which you have very slow mixing, OK? And if you didn't do any learning, and you had your fantasy particles, which are in red, trapped in this minimum, they would just stay there. Because um, the mixing rate is just too slow to escape. But what the learning is doing is saying, OK, wherever the fantasy particles are, we raise the energy landscape. And wherever the data is, that's the green stuff, we lower the energy landscape. So what's going to happen is this minimum is going to go down, but this minimum is going to come up. And it's going to keep coming up because there's more fantasy particles than data. 
until eventually the fantasy particles start escaping. So what's happening is we're getting the effect of fast mixing, not by mixing, because mixing means jumping this barrier. What we're doing is we're changing the energy landscape so these particles can move around, these fantasy particles. And it's because the fantasy particles are involved in the learning. If you weren't learning, these guys would just stay there. I have a model for this, which is, in any democratic society, you need a bunch of political agitators. And what political agitators do is they go around finding injustices. And they agitate. They say, get rid of this injustice. And they sort of aggregate where these injustices are and say, this is a terrible injustice, get rid of it. And so society eventually responds and gradually changes the rules and eventually this injustice starts disappearing. Then what happens? Do, are the agitators happy? No, they're not happy at all. They go off and find some other injustice. And they say, oh, forget about that. You know, black people can be president now, but what about the environment? And so now they agitate about that. And if you fix the environment, they go off and agitate about something else. And this is how a democratic society ought to be. You need these guys. If we had a free press, they'd work for the press. But, um, and they're rushing around finding injustices and fixing them. And the negative particles are doing that. They're rushing around finding things that are deep minima, but do not have lots of data in, and filling them in. And the reason they can mix fast and cover all these things is because they're allowed to change the energy surface. OK. So given that, we can ask, can we make it work better? And so Taman and I developed a method called fast PCD, where you say, well, we've got a problem here. We've got our energy surface. And our energy surface really is our model. And what's happening is these particles that are rushing around, um, being unhappy with things, are actually messing up our model, because they're changing the heights of minimum until they escape. Um, what if we had two energy surfaces? We have the basic energy surface that changes slowly. And then in addition to that, we have an overlay. It's another energy surface that's just added to the first one. But the overlay has the following property. It learns very fast, but it decays to zero very fast. So there's a bunch of fast learning weights that are rapidly decaying to zero. Now what will happen is our negative fantasy particles will cause that overlay to change so that they can escape from local minima in the sum of the two energy functions without messing up the long-term energy function. And that works really well. And Marco Aurelio Ranzato will probably talk about methods that require fast PCD. That is, standard Markov chain methods are just much too slow. But if you add this extra energy function that you're allowed to modify in order to get good mixing, but that decays away to zero, so it's not really part of your final model, you get nice mixing. So you see, Boltz machines are still interesting, even though when they're used as autoencoders for pre-training for deep learning, um, it's not the fact that they're Boltz machines that's relevant at all. It's the fact that they're using noisy hidden units, and they've got a cute way of getting a gradient through noisy hidden units, of uh, backpropagating through noisy hidden units. Um, and I've got a tiny bit more to say. I'm going to go just slightly over time. So I just want to talk a bit about the final problem, which is how to train a full Boltzmann machine. That is, a Boltzmann machine with connections between hidden units. A multi-layer Boltzmann machine is just a full Boltzmann machine where some of the connections between the hidden units are missing, namely connections within a layer and connections between non-adjacent layers. But the general case is just you have some visible units, you have some hidden units, and you allow anything to connect to anything else. And how are we going to train a guy like that? Um, well, you could try variational methods. You could say it's hopeless to really sample for each input from the posterior distribution. That'll take an awful long time. But let's try a variational method. But the problem is that the derivative of the log problem of the data with respect to a weight is the difference of these two expectations. How often these units are on together when you're presenting data, and how often they're on together when you're just sampling from the model. This is what the fantasy, models will, fantasy particles will be sampling. And if you use a variational method for this, it's a disaster. And the reason is, what variational learning does is it says, I'm going to optimize something like this. I'm going to maximize the following. The log probability of the data penalized by the difference, the divergence between the true posterior distribution, which is what I ought to be using for the hidden units. This is separately for each training case. And the approximating distribution that I'm actually using. 
So if these two are the same, this term disappears and you're doing maximum likelihood learning. That's good. If they're not the same, then you change the weights in order to optimize a compromise between making the data likely and making this KL divergence not too big. In other words, trying to make the true distribution more like the approximating distribution. And that's why variational learning works. It's because this is extra term trying to make the approximating distribution, the, sorry, the true distribution, which is controlled by the parameters, be more like the approximating distribution you're using. And because of that, your approximating distribution will end up working quite well. Now, that's all fine, but once you reverse the sign and you start doing this, this term is trying to minimize the probability of the data it gets here. Um, and if you use variation, it's trying to maximize this KL divergence. Well, maximizing a KL divergence is easy. You just set one of these guys to zero, and you can make it infinite. And so it's a disaster, basically. And that's why mean field methods don't work for training Boltzmann machines. They, they have these huge instabilities where suddenly they start making this thing huge. Um, Sorry? Right, you'd have thought this would be the other way around. A P there and a Q there. KL divergence is normally like that. That's not variational learning anymore, and things don't cancel nicely. Um, you, you can't get away with that, basically. In effect, that's what the wake sleep doing algorithm is doing in the sleep phase, and it's a naughty thing to do, and it's not right. Um, anyway. You can't train a Boltz machine with variational learning because this term has the minus sign, and that'll cause this KL divergence to try and get big rather than try and get small, and it'll completely mess up your approximation. But what you can do is use variational learning with this term. So given data, you can use a mean field network to settle down on uh, interpretation of the data, and it'll just assume there's one mode given the data. But that's OK, because if you've got a good model, there typically only is one mode given the data. The data constrains your model, so there's only one reasonable interpretation. That's fine. Um, for this, there have to be many modes, because you want a model of this complicated world in which there's many different things can happen. But here you can use this fast PCD. So here you can use these persistent Markov chains with these fancy particles that run around and that give the effect of very fast mixing because you're using them for unlearning. So as soon as they get stuck somewhere, the energy landscape comes up and they go off somewhere else. And so Russ figured out, Russ Salakudinov figured out that if you used PCD for this and variational for this, it would work nicely. And it does. You can train full Boltzmann machines like that. Of course, it works even better if you pre-train them. So you start off with sensible weights. And that's the very last thing I want to say. Um, if you have a Boltzmann machine with multiple layers, then we're going to end up fine-tuning it by using variational learning for the data-dependent expectations, using a mean field approximation, by using persistent contrast divergence, or fast persistent contrast divergence, for the model's expectations, because that's unbiased. But we also have to initialize them. And there's something subtle about the initialization of a Boltzmann machine. When you pre-train a deep belief net, what you do is you take, you train a Boltzmann machine, you then take the distribution that defines over its hidden units, so that's the prior for the hidden units, and you replace it by the distribution defined by the next Boltzmann machine in the stack. So you take the prior of your first Boltzmann machine, the prior of hidden units, and you completely replace it. And that's why you don't get a Boltzmann machine. That's why you get a deep belief net. But suppose you replaced half that prior in the log domain. Then you'd get a Boltzmann machine. And we can actually prove that. Um, so here's what you do. Train your first Boltzmann machine like this with two sets of visible units and these weights constrained together. You have to initialize these to be the same as the data. So there's a slight approximation there. But you train this. After you've trained What's this, prime? sorry? What's V prime? That's a copy of V to begin with, but it's going to be reconstructed as something different. Um, but to begin with, we'll copy V. You train this. Um, after you've trained it, if you think about the prior over the hidden units, 
this is really the sum of two models. It's this model plus this model. And so you can take the square root of this prior. The way you take the square root of the prior over the hidden units is you just chop out this stuff. And now I can take the square root of a prior here. You also take the distribution you get over the hidden units and you train another Boltzmann machine like that, another restricted Boltzmann machine like this with two sets of hidden units. And again, you initialize these to be the same as those. Actually, you don't need to here because you start with this and so those will get to be, but yeah, but you don't need the initialization trick here. So you train that. And then having trained this, you throw away one set of units. So you're taking the square root of the distribution this defines over H1. You stick them together and so you've now got those two square roots. And if these weights were the same as these weights, then the distribution, if W1 was the same as W2, this distribution would be the same as the distribution here or here. If this has made a better model of the, of the posterior here, then what you get by taking the geometric mean of these two distributions will be a better model, because um, it'll be closer to the posterior. Um, so that's the way you free train a Boltzmann machine, at least if you just want two hidden layers. And for two hidden layers, we can prove this is the right thing to do. For more hidden layers, it becomes a bit heuristic. And there's a paper just come out in neural computation that explains all this. And you can go and look in that paper, or you can wait till Russ explains it all. And he will explain it, I'm hoping, at much greater length, so you actually stand a chance of understanding it. This is just to stop you up. Okay, I'm finished.